Welcome to today's webinar, Rising Telehealth, Behavioral Health Practices, Centering the Needs of Historically Marginalized Youth in California, with today's essential question, how might community-based organizations provide student support, and what can school systems learn from them, specifically related to COVID-19? If you can please put your name and your role and your location in the chat box, it would be really helpful. The comments box is where we're going to be doing the most back and forth. Welcome. My name is Leora wolf She, hers, pronouns, Los Angeles, School Mental Health Lead for the Pacific Southwest MHTTC. And I'm going to invite Deborah to do a quick intro of you, Deborah, and then we're going to rock and roll, move forward. Good morning, everyone. Welcome on this beautiful Wednesday morning. My name is Deborah, and I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the California Alliance of Child and Family Services, as well as the Catalyst Center. Very excited and honored to have you all in the space today. Thank you, Deborah. Those of you who are on with us on Monday, you know that Deborah and I are really enthusiastic and energized, and we also want to make sure that we center our guest teaching as much as possible. So we are going to move through the intro a little bit quicker this morning so that we can get to the gem and the wisdom of our teachers. And I just want to really welcome us with patience. I'm going to move us forward. Welcome to Rising Telehealth Behavioral Health Practices and Centering the Needs of Historically Marginalized Youth in California. Again, today's concentration is how we might, as school systems, learn from community-based organizations. On Monday, we heard from Uticus and also how both RISE and Trauma Transformed and Gaming are used in ways to expand telehealth practices. And we heard from all of you that there was a lot of really good paradigm expansion takeaways from Monday. So if you didn't, if you weren't with us on Monday, please do check it out. Just note that today's session is provided and sponsored by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. Uh, while SAMHSA supports the conversation, the words and thoughts and all provided are of those speakers only. I'm also wanting to just note that this is a really tiny spot. If you are new to us for the Mental Health Technology Transfer Centers, welcome. Again, I'm Yora, the School Mental Health Lead for the Pacific Southwest Region. We're Region 9, U.S. Pacific Islands. Arizona, Nevada, California, and Hawaii. And if you're from our region, uh, particularly because we're, we're partnering with the Catalyst Center today and uh, the California Department of Education and, and Wellness together, most likely you are in California. And if you are not, we still welcome you. So I am really grateful that we are able and our project is able to partner with the Catalyst Center to make this conversation happen. I'm actually just going to move us straight to the Catalyst Center so you can hear from Deborah about who they are and who is also helping us sponsor. Great. Thank you, Leora. So again, this is Deborah Sun with the Catalyst Center. Super honored to be in this space. So much gratitude to Leora and her team, as well as helping Department of Education and Wellness together as they are sponsors, co-sponsors for uh, this wonderful series as we are inspired up the voices of those that are on the ground with the lived experiences marching forward and, and fighting this fight in partnership with us all for the sake of our kids and families. So a little bit about the Catalyst Center, and I'm going to be really quick, super high level, just, you know, in the interest of time. We are a resource vehicle, and as I mentioned, we're connected to the California Alliance for Child and Family Services. We are essentially technical system and training resource center that provides support to the broader field of child and family services. In the state of California, we have a really great resource portal that shares those policy and practice resources. So please check us out. And we also have a seven-day week provider helpline. All the information is located on our website. So uh, catalyst-center.org, uh, feel free to peruse it. Uh, we are here for you. I'm very excited to uh, be in this space with you all as we are all learning about how to partner more deeply and how to move forward in collaboration. Thank you, Liara. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce our, our teachers in this space today, and they are going to introduce themselves, but I'm going to give a super high-level uh, intro, as you can see their bios here. So Francine Ostrom is a clinical supervisor at Lincoln. Uh, she's also part of a research and clinical team with a diabetes, pediatric diabetes center at UCSF, um, and so she's doing a lot of phenomenal, really innovative work in the context of art therapy as they're pivoting into telehealth. And then Rosalind Wingman Kwong is a clinical trainer and EVP coordinator with Hathaway Sycamore Child and Family Services in Southern California. 
as you can see from her bio, again, a wealth of experience as she is going to be sharing her learnings with us as she has helped pivot her team telehealth as well. So super honored to have you both with us, as well as additional colleagues and partners and leaders from their organization that will also be chiming in with their efforts of wisdom as we move forward. As we mentioned, today is session two of our series. On Monday, we focused on partnering and listening to youth and students. Today, we're focusing on partnering with community-based organizations. So I want to acknowledge that some of you might be those community-based organizations. Some of you might be school mental health practitioners. Some of you might be of very different roles. And we welcome it all because part of the reason we're having this series, we partner and partnering with the Catalyst Center, Wellness Together, and the California Department of Education is because we know that we have in place for providing telehealth services is an expansive portfolio of possibility. <laughs> and Rob and Deborah's going to talk a little bit about that, about why we named it Rising Practices. So what we wanted to do is to think about who do we usually not really listen to, but is usually the drivers of solution finding in our work. And so today we'll get to hear from community-based organizations. All right. Very quickly, I am going to name, because some of you are joining us now, that we're going to offer you to take what you need. I said that at the beginning. And I also wanted to mention, I will be sending out a resources aftermath send out after Monday and after Wednesday, because there were so many gorgeous resources that you put in the questions box and in the comments box, and we want to make sure you get them. We also just want to note that Whatever resonates is what you need in this moment. So take one sentence, one practice, one idea or more. Be kind to yourself. There's a lot of information coming to all of us all the time. And that we know that this work is important now because of COVID-19 and also always. So yes, are we talking about rising telehealth practice and centering marginalized youth? We're also talking about thinking about learning in partnership in a different way today. And lastly, of, co- of course, there are three tracks to the learning, us as a learner, myself, us as a professional, me and my work role, or us as a facilitator, and to think about how we've structured this learning. And I'm going to just do a, a quick rebuilder, and I'm actually going to ask you not to answer this question. So if you're answering this question, just pause for a second. I'm doing a little switch up right now. I'm going to ask for you in the chat box to offer one word that comes up when you think about school and community-based organization partnership. One word when you think about school and community-based organization partnership. So it's not the question on the screen. I'm going to say it one more time. So what is one word to think about schools and community-based organization partnership? Okay, so we have collaboration, support, necessary, critical, productive, complicated, all caps. Opportunity, complex, critical, unity, lacking, collaboration, important, another complicated. We're getting a lot of C words, complex, crucial, collaborated, complicated, uh, needed, key. Natalie's offering another C word, challenging. Yes, they also can be stressful. We've got hero and multifaceted. Yes, so you are answering Not the question on the screen, but when you think of community-based organizations and schools and their partnerships, what comes up for you? So we do have a couple of you who are really naming that you have areas of growth in connecting community-based organizations and your schools in this learning. Thank you. So I just want to say that I know that this is a really, really complex conversation about how schools can learn from community-based organizations and vice versa, how community-based organizations can learn from schools. And so as we listen to Francine and Roslyn today and their teams, the question is not to think about who's better or who's doing it the most, the perfect, or who's got this down and we don't have this down and they have this down. Nope. We're actually just thinking about how might we be creative in this moment that calls for more creativity that calls for us to reimagine the challenge and calls for us to reimagine the complication, just like you've named. On that note, Deborah's going to give one or two lines about why we titled it Rising Telehealth. I'll give a couple of notes about why marginalized youth, and then we'll actually move through and forward. Yeah, 
super high level again, uh, not to intentionally gloss over it, but just meaning that there are a lot of folks who are rejoining us and have heard this for the context setting. Uh, why rising telehealth practices? Obviously, a few months ago, our world was completely turned upside down. One of the things that the field recognizes is that there is an enormous amount of resilience, creativity, and just passion that the field exhibited. And we really wanted to recognize and create space for honoring that that work. And this space, we're hoping it does that as we are lifting up the stories of folks who are absolutely practicing telehealth work in innovative and in meaningful ways that we want to help lift up. And we also use the language marginalized youth and youth we marginalize, not to shame us and not to blame us, but actually to call us into action and to shift us into active voice versus passive voice. So we're not saying at-risk youth. We're not saying marginalized youth. We're saying youth we marginalize so that we can really take ownership and accountability and then do the work of dismantling and reimagining and recreating our practices, just like Rosalind and Francine are going to offer two or a couple practices that we might adapt and adopt. Those are two reasons why the session, these sessions are named that. Deborah, you're, you want to do the naming in the moment? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Lyra. You know, I think this, this piece is just for us to recognize that there are a lot of folks in this space right now, folks that represent diverse discipline or field or type of work um, and, and location. There are folks in the state of California widely represented as well as only. Um, and these are all the folks that are in this movement, right, that are committed to the kids and families that we, we provide support and care for. And recognizing that given, uh, you know, our individual lives, our collective lives, our communal lives, um, we are all in different phases of being. And so, you know, we bring that to our work. We bring that to the space. And so we just wanted to make sure that we're naming the fact that we need to be creative. And this isn't a one-size-fits-all. Um, it's a sharing. Um, and we're hoping that it's an inspiration for everybody uh, in this space as you're moving through your own individual phase. So the purpose of our time together today is exactly to do, do a listening in. So we want to be really clear. Uh, Rosalind and Francine are offering, like we said, a couple practices that might be rising, that might be expanding. And we know that you all also have techniques and solutions and strategies that you've been playing with. I'm using playing um, specifically because it is a craft and an art to think about how we can support our young people specifically in transitional times and in chaotic times. So if you have a practice or you have a teaching or you have a wondering, please put them in the comments box or in the questions box so that we can move forward. I want to start. We're going to do some. We're opening and grounding, which we did. We're going to hear hopefully from Francine first. If Francine's audio is still having some challenge, then we'll Rosalind, I'm cueing you. We're going to first move to Rosalind. And then ideally, we're going to have time for some discussion, Q&A, and then close. And I'm going to see Francine, if you can join us. Hi, as Deborah said, my name is Francine Ostrom, and I am a clinical supervisor at Lincoln. At Lincoln, with families in various settings, in the schools, homes, in the community, in the courts, and of course now on telehealth. Lincoln's mission is to disrupt the cycle of poverty and trauma and to empower children and families to build strong futures. As you can see from the slide, Lincoln focuses on three areas, education, family, and well-being. I work as part of the HOPE team, which is called, or stands for Helping Open Pathways to Education. So I came to Lincoln uh, six years ago as an expressive arts and family therapist specialized in treating chronic stressors and or trauma with an emphasis on chronic medical conditions. In my many different roles as a teacher, trainer, supervisor, and psychotherapist, I repeatedly witnessed how art-based intervention moves mountains for children and families, not to mention providers. So another inspiration for developing pain is, of course, art as you know, is a fundamental human language that reaches across the developmental spectrum and across cultures. There is no place in the world and no time in human history that art has not been utilized to capture the past, to teach and learn about safety and danger, to express sorrow, 
or it is used to celebrate, to connect. Think of all the shelter-in-place window drawings from young children, youth, and adults around the world. And there is art as a call to action, to protest, to expose social injustice and oppression. Think of all the signage and powerful murals and the demonstrations, again, also around the world. Another critical reason for developing paint was that I felt frustrated and limited by pre-existing trauma models that were treating post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress, past trauma. But as you know, most of the youth we serve are not post-trauma or post any kind of stress. The pandemic and all that is associated with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor could not make this more clear. Painson is an initiative that seeks to disrupt stress, which, when chronic, we know is just terrible for your health and for cognitive and emotional development. Paint is an initiative that seeks to disrupt stress, as I said, and um, and Nadine Burke Harris is working very hard to bring attention to the negative impact of toxic stress through the ACEs Aware Initiative, of which Paint, incidentally, is a smart as a part, a small one, but still a part. For students and young minds, chronic stress makes it very hard to concentrate to make important and good decisions, to maintain hopefulness and purpose, to be playful and curious, all cornerstones of learning and relating. Because trauma is known to usurp the capacity to use verbal language, nonverbal processing is often a first step in trauma integration. So for all of those reasons and more, the language we all share needed a more intentional place in psychotherapy at Lincoln and beyond. So Deborah had asked me to address how we transitioned to telehealth. And I have to say, it feels like a really long time ago that we did this. And that when it happened, it happened very, very quickly. We basically transitioned to telehealth from a Friday to a Monday. And that was my definition of a team effort. The interdepartmental collaboration was amazing. Leading the way was our CEO, Alan Beckwar. Emails were flying back and forth Saturday and Sunday, and on Monday, we were coordinating with IT to get Zoom accounts to all providers. Development and marketing immediately put up an active site with resources for free technology, free internet access, Wi-Fi, free food, as well as posting vital COVID-19 updates. Kirsten Melton obtained computers, phones, and gift cards for family. Families and clinical directors, especially Nancy Harrington, worked on the legal and ethical aspects of providing telehealth. All of the direct service providers rallied to share their resources and their discoveries. Our inboxes were flooded with ideas and information. The program director of Hope, Ana Mejia, made certain each kid had a laptop. Men, when summer came, advocated for them so that they were able to keep their Chromebooks over the summer. Prior to COVID-19, I regularly offered telehealth services, so I was able to share lessons learned and strategies I used, and I offered those in the combination of didactic trainings as well as hands-on art processing sessions. But while that was a long time ago, in many ways and in other, way, other ways, telehealth and online learning are very new, and we have to keep building our capacity to deliver engaging and develop and uh, this way. So what stays the same when providing emotional support, whether in person or in telehealth, is our rationale and the way in which we connect. So I was saying before that at the heart of paint, there are two key players in facilitating change and promoting wellness, and those are expression and relationship. And the way in which we anchor relational, the relational piece in our work in paint is informed by evidence-based treatment models and the writings of leading attachment researchers and clinicians, Alicia Lieberman, Peter Fonagy, Arietta Slade et al., Barbara Stroud, and in the art therapy domain, Linda Chapman. And something that their attachment work has in common is that they all engage in imagining and wondering. And there are lots of good reasons to do this because imagining 
and wondering about another person's state of mind and one's own is linked to really great things. More enjoyable social interactions, improved cognitive outcomes, reflective function, which is what this imagining and wondering is technically called, is linked to a decrease in CPS reporting, a decrease in caregiver depression, as well as a decrease in obesity rates. Children who live in foster care, whose foster parents are trained in reflective functioning, have better childhood outcomes across multiple domains. This is pretty remarkable that a commitment to wondering about what someone else is thinking, feeling, intending, believing can bring about such profound social and long-term change. The other piece that stays the same on telehealth is the use of expression, which is known to calm an activated stress response system. Think here of Linda Chapman and Dan Siegel's work and Bruce Perry's work. Name it to team it. But sometimes it isn't easy to do with words, and art can provide an alternative and a supplement. Some kids, sometimes kids don't want to talk, or they can't. But the most important objective is to stay connected, to stay in relationship where possible, remembering that the biggest tool is the experience of the relationship, especially in disrupted learning communities and new social isolation. Emily Daniel and Kendra Ng, who are here with me today, they are both high school clinicians, and they bring tears to my eyes. Um, they're here with me today, and they will talk about how they have stayed connected, and it's really remarkable what they've done. So providing opportunities for expression, yes, verbal check-ins and checklists related to COVID-19, of course, and Rosalind will provide vital tools to do this. The mental health aspects of navigating the virus and racism and oppression and how they are all complexly intertwined will require specialized support, creative minds. We have not seen anything like this before in scale. And also, I think the uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and, 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 and are really showing us how we really need to reexamine what it is that we are doing everywhere. I was very stressed when I made this slide. It says from pragmatics to theory, tools to implement paint by a telehealth, and it really should say from theory to pragmatics. So sorry about that. And so one of the ways we are facilitating both relationship and expression is through the Zoom whiteboard feature, through screen sharing, sharing of images, writing poems together, interactive art expression, treatment planning together on the, the Zoom feature, and finding accessible and relevant materials and expression for expression in the home. For example, we are using a paper as a surface and a sculptural medium, which I'll talk about in a moment. As I said, several months ago, the drawing on the on the board, um, drawing board on Zoom was flashing news, and I'm sure most people know about it now. But in mid-March, this was a revelation, and it was, of course, exciting to still be able to connect with kids via art as a language with kids who did not have art materials in the home. So um, when they had phones, this can be done on phones, and it can be done on the computers. So in Paint, we begin every session with the practice of checking in with a simple question, what color is your heart today? And we do this to expand emotions vocabulary, to put out a call and hope for a response. We do this to signal that feelings can be temporary, we have today, and that feelings can change. And if some of you are thinking this is, is, is nothing new, you're absolutely right. This intervention resonates with intervention targets of several evidence-based treatment models. Uh, DBT comes to mind. But what I like about this intervention is that it is a really tender way of asking about feeling states, mental states, and recognizing that feelings are often expressed indirectly and in the body. This year is a playful heart and done right at the beginning of Shelter in Place by a youth who, because she's autoimmune compromised, would likely die if infected. She has to be very isolated, also within the home, and from other, other family members who do go out into the world as essential workers. And perhaps, therefore, we have the very small, wrapped, enveloped red heart. 
There is also perhaps a denial of fear, a form of escape, a wish to play like before, a wish to stay connected in the context of massive disconnection. And perhaps it is a heart that is not yet able to hold the heavy and the light, or perhaps just not wanting to. This year is is pretty self-explanatory, and I know it's hard to see, uh, but it's a picture of sorting circles. And it is a way to use the drawing board to design treatment goals, uh, distinguish between what youth can do and really maybe what I can't do anything and where they are at the mercy of forces so much greater than themselves. But sometimes distinguishing those two things can help feel a little more anchored and, and allow them to focus on what they might be able to do. Uh, the other thing I like about this kind of treatment planning is that it is interactive. So many youth I work with, they don't really like to type, so I can type what they tell me to type. I also like to offer circles because it's one of the first representational shapes young children draw, oftentimes as heads, to create themselves, significant caregivers, and the sun. Another step in paint is imagining safety, which, of course, conjures imagined and real danger and here in the form of a paper dragon. Because we may not be able to be in the same room offering or replenishing supplies for quite some time, Paint teaches providers how to help students make use of random household objects, paper clips, rubber bands, recycled paper, for example, to engage in our trauma sequence. We offer demonstrations using paper not just as a surface to write on or paint on, but as a sculptural medium that can be folded, crumpled, rolled, cut, taped, glued to build and to facilitate vital somatosensory processing and regulation. As for COVID-19 specific uses, we've taken six and a half pieces of eight and a half by 11 pages, turning them sideways to explore the notion of six feet, a very new notion of safety and danger, sometimes six feet seeming very far away and sometimes way too close. We've used paper as a surface to draw onto, of course, and in our imagining safety in the context of covid we turn to the traditional ancient tradition of hand tracings or hand prints to create playful daily reminders for washing one's hands and keeping them out of one's face. And we invite all household members to join in this. We've used paper to develop images of protest and outrage, as well as the folk. Kids have asked to learn how to draw the fist of protest and black power, and we can show them. With our ACES AWARE grant, we do aim to send out basic supplies such as scissors and glue, and in the context of staying indoors, window markers to communicate with the outside world. Before I end here, because I see I'm running out of time, other really important things to acknowledge in this tool, and I think today we have lived experience with it, is that technology can be disruptive and connecting at the same time. It can be frustrating. There can be an emotional delay frozen screens, difficult connections, especially while trying to process difficult feelings. And that can feel very alienating and we just want to be able to acknowledge it. But while we are also grieving losses of connection and oftentimes privacy, kids don't have a lot of privacy at home, we want to celebrate unexpected gains, glimpses into the home environment, for example, where we can better assess need and strength. And then we can meet family members as well as pets. And one of my favorite was meeting a goldfish named Jaws. And, um, you know, it seems to me that there is an obvious need for increased transparency of alliance, along with explicit reassurance about being there for resources, for resourcing and ongoing connection. But also, I will be back. We will be back if we get disconnected. I will be back. So it is fitting to kind of break off here as we are still at the beginnings of all of this with many more questions and ideas than antidotes. So I'm going to turn this over to Rosalind now. Thank you very much. So I want to just take a moment before we move to Rosalind. In the comments box, if you, we're going to invite you to put one idea or one takeaway or one new way of thinking from what we just heard from Francine. And if you also have questions, 
And I know some of you have questions, um, to please put them in the in the questions box. So we heard um, gratitude for informative, and maybe Areli, you can put what struck you as informative. Allison is saying thank you for the idea of painting on Zoom on the whiteboard feature. And I do want to uh, name that we have some questions about if we don't have ability to work on Zoom, are there other features that will allow us to uh, creative, go to Adobe, et cetera? Mardine is saying art as a call to action really struck. Mardine, thank you. And Carrie, the idea of paper sculpting. Valerie, reimagining stay using random household items to build and facilitate. I agree, Valerie. Ritu, the idea of imagination and creativity to support well-being. Elizabeth, art being therapeutic rather than just crafting. That's right. And that's such a great connection, Elizabeth, with what we heard on Monday of Rise and Rise's invitation for us to think about the difference and similarities between therapy and therapeutic activities and how they might speak both and. And Jane, also reimagining safety. So there are lots of themes, lots of themes coming up. I'm going to read one more. Cynthia, the concept of expression and relationship as being the tools that will carry us, carry through telehealth. Right. So sometimes we think that telehealth is the actual technology and we forget that the relationship and safety is the therapy or therapeutic connection. And the telehealth is the way we get there. Um, so we can spend time concentrating on the technology and then maybe we focus on honing and crafting the way that we're supporting the, the young ones that we serve and the youth we serve. Let's see other takeaways. Well, on that note, I'm going to mute myself so we can learn from Roslyn. And thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Roslyn. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, Leora. Good morning, everyone. It's really my pleasure to introduce to you what we call the Consumer and Caregiver Checklist, which is a tool that was developed to engage with students and their families during the COVID-19 pandemic. I am currently the Clinical Trainer and Evidence-Based Practice Coordinator at Hathaway Sycamore's Child and Family Services. The agency currently provides services to children and youth, young adults, and actually across seven of the eight service areas in the Los, in the Los Angeles County. Our largest program is our school-based services where we have mental health providers on school campuses, providing services to students and families. Young adults that are leaving the foster care system are at elevated risk for homelessness, and our transitional independent living program supports those young adults emancipating out of the foster care system by providing housing, mental health services, as well as skill development to assist them in living independently. We also have a residential campus providing services to young people referred to us from the Department of Children and Family Services and County Probation. We have the foster family agency, and we also provide community-based services responding to the mental health needs of children and families in their homes and communities. We have a training institute, and I hope to be able to share a little bit uh, later on uh, our discussion about our training and consultation program for schools and educators as we prepare to return to school. Our mission is to cultivate hope and resilience to enrich the well-being of children, adults, families, and communities. Now, the realities of COVID-19 health crisis and the Saver at Home guidance have really drastically changed the lives of students and their families that were And as providers and educators, we've become one of the most important and sometimes really the only safety net for our students and their families. Of course, the best practice guidelines are still preparing for your sessions, establishing an agenda, and following up to make sure we're eliciting sharing of progress. But our clinical training department really worked hard and wanted to provide our staff with additional support by offering what we call clinical tips for staff in the use of telehealth. And in reviewing how to concretely support staff to make services relevant to COVID, Dr. Gamio Stanek, our VP of Clinical Practice, Training, and Research and Evaluation, came up with the idea to develop a checklist to be used at every contact as a practical way to engage and touch base with students and caregivers on a regular basis specifically surrounding COVID. And this really helped us ensure that we are asking everyone a similar set of questions, including our marginalized youth and families. This is what the checklist looks like. We included a primer for the checklist, and we've worked really closely with our program staff as well as program supervisors in developing this checklist. And um, included a primer where 
we're just giving them some ideas about what they can say to introduce this to consumers and their families. And the checklist also consists of a list of open-ended questions. Examples of questions from the checklist include, during the previous week, have any circumstances for you or your family changed that is affecting you? Or how is your daily life impacted by the current situation? What skills can we review to help you deal with that? And we also have a caregiver checklist that looks like this, and it includes questions like, what are you doing with your youth or your child when you're together? And first and foremost, like when we're thinking about the why, why do we even propose using the checklist? Because um, to a lot of people, it sounds like another piece of paper, another tool. Um, it's really, really similar to the reasons why best practice involves really starting sessions with an agenda. It's very structured and predictable, especially during a time of crisis when things are just not so predictable. Having something that's predictable really seems to help a child or youth and their caregivers feel safe. This also offers a very consistent way of monitoring any changes in terms of how the student or the family is functioning. And as we can all relate during this specific time, things do change from week to week and even day to day. And the word consistent is the key. We're asking every student and we're asking every single contact. This is also a direct and behaviorally specific way for the service provider to ask about the impact of the current health crisis on the functioning. And we have clinicians who reach out to our department saying, like, can I even ask about COVID? Is this within my scope? Or what can I say? And with the use of the checklist, they were actually very encouraged when the caregivers and the students told them, you know what? No one really has asked us about this. And so thank you for asking about it. The checklist can be viewed as sort of like a way to identify launching paths for relevant topics to be explored during the service because clinicians can extend the conversation with students based on what response were being given. We also use the checklist because it normalizes the reality that a current situation is just really challenging because the questions are phrased in a way that invites honest sharing of struggles. We're not asking if they're being impacted. But we're really asking them how they're being impacted and with the assumption that they are being impacted. Uh, an example is that one clinician actually introduced this list of questions by stating, given the current situation, I'm going to ask you some questions that may be a little more personal, but it's because I care about how you're doing. What we've found is that using open-ended questions like these minimizes the consumer's and also the family's tendency to give us predictable, short-circuit responses about their well-being because it opens up an opportunity for engagement. Because I'm sure that we've all gotten the quick response when we're asking on telehealth or when we're even having like a Zoom meeting, how are you doing? How have you been? The quick answer is always, I'm fine. So how exactly do we use it? When we think about using the checklist, I think this is a very important topic to touch on. We tell our clinicians to actually set this up as an expectation. So you're structuring the session so that you are always beginning with this. And again, structure provides a sense of safety. When it's set up as an expectation, almost all students and their caregivers that we're working with are actually really okay with this. We also want to use the checklist as the means to connect. As Marissa mentioned in the session on Monday, and also Francine just kind of put it very beautifully just now, we heal in relationships, and the relationships are really, really important. And using the checklist is just a way for clinicians to really extend the conversations during the session based on what the responses are. We invite them to avoid reading mechanically, because when a relationship has been established, students and their families can really trust that the clinician comes from a place of genuine desire to be there for them. What we found is that when we have clinicians that are using it in that way, this is when it's the most effective. And if necessary, rephrase. Look at the list as a foundation, but adapt it to the particular consumer. You're still asking the same set of questions, but the way that you may be asking them can be a little bit different. So the checklist is almost like the scaffolding of things that you will ask. Each appropriate adaptation is totally fine. Um, the clinicians that you will hear from a little bit later on asking a five-year-old, the wording that she used is actually very simple. Like, what feelings are new for you? What are you feeling in your heart right now that are new? When asking a 12-year-old, maybe they would be asking, do you have any recent thoughts? Right? What are your new thoughts? 
Let's talk a little bit about what have been the responses of the checklist. We have found that the general response has actually been very positive. Clinicians asking the questions relating to COVID and supporting families and really identifying the needs of the students and their families. We'll look forward to be able to share with you some success stories later on. Based on some of the responses, clinicians, along with what we call our community wellness specialists and also parent partners, have been able to respond to the need. Once they're able to ask those questions, we're able to identify the need and we can respond to those needs. Have staff that are going out to do suicide assessment and safety planning with PPEs and social distancing. And then we have staff that are accompanying parents to the hospital. Maybe identifying families that needed additional resources and also delivering food or connecting them with our Island Park Food Bank and other food banks. Some programs are delivering goodie bags with, with games for the families, helping a parent create a family budget because of financial struggles. And this all came from being able to ask those questions. What changes for you during this time? And one school-based clinician actually identified the need for a student who wasn't able to complete her homework and this early on in the pandemic. The clinician actually went and picked up a textbook from the school and delivered it to the student so that she could complete her homework. Another clinician also delivered a clarinet read to a student so that she can continue to use music as a way of coping. I have included a couple of quotes for you. Mari, who is our school-based clinician that works mainly with high school students, she basically shared with us that her consumers have really responded very well, and the youth really like having the opportunity to process. Elizabeth, whom you will hear from a little bit later on, actually worked with a range of school-age kids from 5 to 12. And for Elizabeth's clients, it seemed to really help avoid the habitual didactic of, how are you doing? I'm fine. And this is what we seem to be so pre-programmed to give in the Western culture, even in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. And when we think about barriers, what we have heard is that not a lot. We have not heard of any students or caregivers that blank white refuse to be asked these questions. Again, it goes back to the why or the how, right? So how we ask questions. One of the barriers that we do encounter sometimes is the caregiver. And when the discussion becomes a little bit more just about them. And uh, once again, the checklist is there because they feel like they haven't really been asked some of these questions. So it's easy for them to start sharing a little bit about how they're doing. And it shows us just how the checklist does elicit the sharing of needs. And it does take some skills on the clinician's part to be able to direct the conversation back to the student and the family, of course, after validating and being empathetic towards the caregiver. And this may actually lead to additional conversation surrounding the need for mental health services for caregivers. We also have encountered some provider barriers, meaning that we have heard of clinicians just not wanting to use the checklist, and we can understand why. A lot of times it's because they perceive it as just one extra form. And one thing for us to think about as maybe trainers or uh, leaders is how to present this as a tool, but not necessarily as a script or as a structure. When we think about the successful use of checklists, it will support clinicians with engaging with students and their families. And we just included a few more tips on engagement that we found to be helpful. You know that definitely with engagement, we always want to make sure we're communicating sincerity, the tone of voice, facial expression, being empathetic, being a good listener from the very first connection. And as always, affirm their strength, acknowledge their feelings, use reflective listening. Um, but specific to telehealth, what we found is that increasing narration of nonverbal cues, which we've learned from many of the other webinars that have been offered, definitely seems to help describe your own nonverbal cues and maybe theirs too. That seems to really help, especially when maybe not a lot of uh, nonverbal cues can be picked up during telehealth. Normalizing, using normalizing uh, language definitely has helped incorporate the use of we to just normalize current structures. And when appropriate, of course, use some self-disclosure and get right back to the student. Uh, we've included some other creative ways and other resources as well. Just want to highlight a couple of resources there, including Sesame Street and Communities, which is a platform for younger kids. It has a lot of videos as well as interactive games and handouts on specific topics, including health crisis, 
uh, hand washing even, or uh, trauma and grief. So uh, just resources for you. But we're definitely looking forward to talking more with you during our discussion. Here's my contact information. Thank you so much for the opportunity to just introduce you to the tool. Thank you so much, Roslyn. Uh, so I'm going to invite you again in the comments box to take one moment of reflection, one moment of inhale and exhale to name one takeaway or one learning or aha that you are holding from what Roslyn presented. I know I'm holding uh, really the, the importance of consistency and predictability and the importance of um, really ensuring that our telehealth practices are multimodal for multimodal learners both thematically and also visually, right? So Adrian is saying getting back to structure, getting out of the didactic, how are you doing? Yes, structure to build a sense of safety. Thank you. Oh, we're giving an outlook for what a checklist could even be, Rodlin. <laughs> yes, that's so powerful. Michael, being aware of close-ended questions. Mm -hmm. And Francine, holding and recognizing the body, the soul, and it's holding a lot of our experience in this moment. And directly asking about the COVID and social distancing experience as a norm. Thank you, Emily. I'm also seeing Ritu, narration of nonverbal cues. And the depth of the questions being asked. And I, you know, this is reminding me in our follow up resources, I will also send a list of questions that we've been learning from that are beyond the how are you. Wonderful. Thank you. And is that, I think is that that's how you pronounce your name is naming structure versus template is helpful. That's right. So having the scaffold and the architecture and then moving and working from that. Okay, let's see a couple more. Lots of gratitude, Roslyn, for the checklist. And of course, we know it's beyond the checklist. It's a tool to then surface and engage connection, relationship, and safety. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Wendy, asking what, what is changing for you at this time or what's changing for you at this time, internally, externally, in your familiar relationships, in your community? Mm -hmm. All right. We're moving into discussion now. So Deborah will be moderating. We are going to actually model our own telehealth queuing, <laughs> our own our own queuing, so that we can really work with the with the constraints of uh, this teaching. And so I'm going to go off, and Deborah, take it away. Fantastic. I'm going to pose a series of questions for the Lincoln team and the Hathaway Sycamore team for the audience. Um, if you're inspired and moved and curious, please do feel free to type in questions in the chat box. Um, we'll try to address them, you know, as we go along, as well as um, create space uh, towards the end to also uh, verbalize them to the panelists. So, uh, first question for for our teachers today. Um, you know, you spoke a little bit about this, but I'm curious if you all have any stories or anecdotes that be meaningful to share in light of how you feel your telehealth model or strategy has provided a positive impact in engaging marginalized students? Well, I'd love to hear what Emily and Kendra uh, have prepared. I would say uh, that for me, just the fact that we're staying connected is just the most powerful thing about it all. But how about Emily? I... Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. I am a clinician at a high school in Oakland. Oftentimes, we serve as a bridge to connect with families who may not feel as connected to school. In my experience with a telehealth model, you know, a lot of the work in the beginning has really been focused on basic needs, making sure that you know, our families have the resources that they need, and caregivers who have lost their jobs, who may be undocumented. Um, helping find financial assistance, housing, those things have been, um, you know, I think, thinking about like hierarchy of needs, those have been, you know, the main things that um, in the beginning that I was working on. Just moving on from that, though, I think um, really with the telehealth model, like consistency, consistent flexibility is really key. Uh, for example, you know, we know the importance of providing consistent weekly time for families and youth, provides containment. But I also think, you know, meeting them where they're at. So I've done a lot of, like, quick check-ins, FaceTime, Zoom, different platforms for whatever they're, uh, you know, whatever they feel comfortable with. I feel like that's really been helpful in, in being flexible on my end. 
And also I found that focusing on being in the here and now with youth has been really helpful. I've been doing this through mindful grounding techniques and also art interventions. Uh, so many times, you know, youth are not in a confidential space at this time. And so art interventions can be really helpful when ver- verbal communication is limited. So, for example, I have used interventions such as like a handful of feelings or what color is your heart today, which Francine spoke about earlier, and then dollars where youth can identify their feeling states without verbal interaction. And so youth have really enjoyed the process of like tracing their hands or the repetitive motions of creating a mandala. I've seen it like, you know, work to calm the nervous system and sort of implement those grounding techniques. Yeah, I feel like art can definitely be a space where you're not able to verbally communicate. It can be a really good way to be able to communicate with the youth. That's all for now. Thank you so much for your sharing. Is there anyone from the Hathaway team that wants to share an interesting story? Yeah, go ahead, Rosalind. Thank you, Deborah. I want to introduce to you uh, one of our clinicians. She's a school-based clinician named Elizabeth Ortiz. She's an associate MFT, and she's going to share with us her success story. So, Elizabeth, Lizzie. Uh, so, one of my success stories in working with the checklist has definitely been to incorporate the family and the child in, uh, in terms of me. So, being able to normalize virtual learning, but also helping them maintain consistency of telehealth. So, with this particular family, um, it was really difficult for the family to be able to engage in telehealth with such young ages from four, seven, and eight just to be able to sit in the computer and uh, provide this new structure. Um, so just helping me meeting the family to do, just like Emily mentioned, using uh, the whiteboard feature in our telehealth platform, um, definitely engaged them. And uh, I was able to get a really good turnaround in having telehealth uh, sessions. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, I'm stepping in for Deborah, who seems to, <laughs> seems to keep getting bounced off. I see that Kendra, Francine, I think you're inviting your colleague Kendra to speak to the question too, and then we'll move on to our next question. Go for it, Kendra. Hi. Thanks for having all of us. I'm really appreciating all of the discussion today. I have so many thoughts about telehealth, <laughs> and it's been such an amazing last few months trying to figure all of this out. And I think right now, at least in Oakland, we're on the eve of starting school again next week. So I have a lot of my mind about what that's going to look like after having like a pretty wonderful summer of being able to connect with students and their families pretty, you know, pretty consistently and easily. And just as one of my frames, I'm really Trying to hold um, Dr. Joy DeGru and also Dr. Kenneth Hardy, just their frames around the importance of relationships, the healing therapeutic relationship, but also the web of relationships and how much loss there's, there's just so much loss around all of the daily consistency that students have, the faces that they see, the like mini interactions that they have in the hallway with teachers restorative justice coordinators, coaches, drama coaches. And so just thinking about how to enter the school year and really trying to activate these webs of relationships for students so that they truly do feel like they are not losing their safe and supportive relationships. But yeah, so that's really on my mind as far as re-entering the school year. And then also I just wanted to say, you know, anecdotally, around like making telehealth work like I've gotten really used to looking you know talking to the ceiling or the corner of my client's face (laughs) and like really not getting you know to see all of them and just getting really comfortable with like meeting them where they're at as far as that goes a lot of like by the end of the school year in May a lot of the students that I work with were like just done looking at themselves on camera there's just like a level of self-consciousness at that developmental period that I think can be pretty excruciating right now. Um, and so I was just like, I'm totally okay with not ha- like, I don't have to see you every time. And I've, you know, I've even got one student who is so self-conscious about his voice 
that a lot of times we'll be on Zoom together and he'll just be chatting me and just like, you know, just like being okay, uh, being okay with like hearing a lot about video games. <laughs> uh, just really want like wanting the relationship to feel safe and supportive, like within the the moment of contact like within the session and then also outside of that as far as like okay I'm gonna call your mom and like talk to her about this and what's going on with your cousin and just like really trying to yeah be supporting the relation not just our relationship but all of our relationships in this collective moment. Thank you. I I don't think I'm in the developmental place that uh the youth that you're working with but I can tell you that I'm a little bit tired of seeing my face on the videos so I'm also <laughs> that might be a shared human shared human experience I want to go to uh the next question and this is really speaking as community-based organizations as practitioners a partner with schools or partner with school mental health professionals Roslyn Francine and team what would you like to ask of your school partners to consider or do differently or do similarly as we start the school year thinking about school mental health? One uh, of my thoughts is that tapping into curiosity and playfulness and maybe following youth's lead in learning. What do they want to learn? What is relevant learning right now? Because I think going to problem sets it just does not make sense in this this crisis. And I think um, back to feelings again, I, I think school, school staff, teachers, there's no reason why they can't do a version of what color is your heart today with the kids. And also, uh, Roslyn, maybe, maybe a checklist for, for teachers at the beginning of, of, of class. And, uh, I think constantly assessing Zoom fatigue. You know, this is, this is an endurance contest really. And how can we help, how can we help you? And I, I think Kendra was speaking to that too, that too is like in the summer, the connection might have been facilitated by the fact that there was a lot of freedom and uh, in quotes, definitely not freedom, but freedom from Zoom and freedom from a rigorous school schedule for many kids. So. I think some of the things that we have thought about that would be very helpful is definitely the collaboration and partnering. So when we're thinking about what we as community-based organization can do, we are thinking about how we can start to create opportunities for increased connection to the school community. And because of that, actually, our training institute does have a proposal for a training and consultation program that we have available. And you can find the uh, handout actually available for you in the handout box. Uh, This is an initiative that we are, what we're hoping to do is to really be able to partner with schools, be able to provide uh, support as we think about transitioning back. Uh, Our team actually was talking a little bit about how the technical support, and and I think like I would love to have uh, Rebecca Liel, who is one of our clinical supervisors, also I'm in to to this discussion as the clinical supervisor too. I think sometimes we do run into technical issues too because we have students that are delivered, maybe computers, but however, what they are capable of doing with the Chromebook that they have been delivered may not have the same program that we use for telehealth. And so being able to collaborate, I think, as the team and be able to really have the two tech teams collaborate. We also talk about the dream of having a community-based organization, having someone that is really dedicated to tech support for for consumers and also for their families. Um, because like right now, we know we have a tech team supporting staff. When it comes to supporting our students and also their families, it seems like that, you know, that may be a little bit uh, harder for us to be able to do. So I, at this time, I want to invite Rebecca Yell, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, and if she can join us in the conversation. So just to piggyback on what Rosalind was saying, would really benefit from having the tech support work with the families. That would be really helpful. And then some other things that we wanted to keep happening was being able to use telehealth so that way the families had more access to some of the resources that we're not able to provide when we're in person. So 
on telehealth, we've been able to use more videos. Even in our group supervisions, we're sharing resources a lot faster. So I feel like telehealth has really uh, branched out our ability to reach other families and family members in the home, specifically with just kind of on the checklist topic. So that's been significantly helpful with the clinicians to feel more comfortable on what they should be asking. And you guys mentioned earlier about should we ask, should we not ask, is this their scope? And we've been having a lot of group supervision conversations around that. And I think that that's where the checklist really comes in handy. Thanks, Thanks, Rebecca. Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do one last question before we close. And the last question, Rosalind, for you as we, as we move into closing, which is one, maybe one to two pieces of advice that you have for folks who are thinking about innovating and expanding their telehealth practices specifically to support youth who we put in the margins, either in a, because of historical or contemporary structures, policies, and practices. So one word of advice, Rosalind, for, from you to our community, our 200 folks here, and then we're going to move into closing. Maybe I can start with our end. I, I think definitely for us, one thing that would be something to keep in mind is just being mindful of the tech and accessibility issues for our um, youth and families, just being prepared for that. I think we all really working through some of the tech challenges as we have today, this morning. And so I just want to do a big shout out for the the team <laughs> of how we've kind of jumped through hope today. So thank you so much. And thank you all the participants for your flexibility and, and patience with this too. And so I'm just like really thinking that this is a normal thing that we'll have to deal with and just expect that as something that is going to happen in terms of tech issues. It's just something that we're going to have to continue to learn to resolve and adapt, right? And so the second note kind of following that is definitely something I've learned from my colleagues, from Rebecca, from her team, from Elizabeth, is definitely the ability to be able to learn with the youth. And I think that's something beautiful in this process while I have been kind of thinking about um, how to do this presentation, what I've learned from their team is definitely the fact that uh, there's so much to be learned from the students and their caregivers. And I feel like our you know, mental health is still continuing to evolve. And so it's just so uh, such a humbling experience to to know that this is something that we'll have to continue to, to learn. And so that openness to being able to learn from our students and from our colleagues and from each other, definitely something I think would be important to keep in mind. Thank you, Rosalind. And I just, I want to name that part of the trauma-informed shift and part of our work as school mental health leaders, community-based organization leaders, and youth advocates is to move from a power to a power with. And I think what we're hearing from Francine and Rosalind and team is that a rising telehealth practice can really truly be learning to or at a client to learning with the young people that we serve and that who are our greatest teachers. And what an amazing experience to get a our own embodied opportunity to practice feeling frustrated or wanting the or a platform not working or wanting to be engaged in the learning and also having to work in teams in order to show up for the learning. So I want to say we're going to move into closing. And I also want to say that at the very beginning, we started off the time is limited, but the urgency isn't, meaning that if when and when you out your survey, which you hopefully will do, that you can say, we want to hear more. We want to learn more about this. We'd like to learn about this more in a workshop. I'd like this kind of training. And, uh, and this is not the only moment to be engaged in learning in this discussion. So I want to do a huge thank you to our partners at Wellness Together, our partners at the California Department of Education, and a massive, massive thank you, cannot see her right now, but Deborah Son, who was on earlier and who was such an organizer and backbone to bringing in both Aang and Marissa on Monday, I forget what day it was today, and then Rosalind and Francine today for this series. So incredible, incredible gratitude. I want to point to, we're going to send resources as you navigate, but we've got a lot of resources coming from our center to you to support your learning. I'm actually just going to go back here before we get into all the resources and do a couple other pointers. Please, yes, in the comments box, if you can close out the note of gratitude, particularly for 
Francine Roslin's team who offered a lot of their work vulnerably, and that you do have the caregiver checklist and the flyer for the training program that was mentioned in your handout. And we will be sending out the resources and the decks that were mentioned in both sessions by the end of this week. So when this platform closes, which we're going to do in about two minutes, you're going to get a link to a survey. And we really, really encourage you to fill it out, what you are hoping and wishing and wanting for your learning moving forward. I hope that Francine's team and Rosalind's team, you are seeing the thank yous in the comments box. We are incredibly grateful. And I want to end with a note of deep, bold, italicized, highlighted font that we do not have to do this work alone. And we should not do this work alone. And we cannot do this work alone. We do it in partnership. We do it in team. And we do it in collaboration. And just like you said at the very beginning, yes, it's collaboration, sometimes really hard and challenging, 100%. And is it the only way that we can support ourselves and each other to do the the justice work that we're dedicated to? Absolutely. So on that note, we are going to close today. Again, I'm Leora Kumendal Halfney for the Pacific Southwest. My colleague Deborah Son at the Catalyst Center. On behalf of both of us, we are so grateful for your patience and for your tenacity and for your curiosity and your play in this conversation.